Okay, also hello from my side. Uh, as Marcos already announced, it's now my part to do a little commercial stuff. Um, you should know it already, we are offering this additional evening event. Um, hopefully most of you have seen it already. Um, I'd like to invite you today as well. Uh, maybe I repeat myself, but the basic idea is to offer a nice cozy atmosphere with uh, delicious food and drinks. Um, and we hope that you uh, that we have a lot of nice technical discussions. So uh, feel, free to, uh, feel free to join us if you want to talk a little bit more uh, about the stuff Martin is presenting or if you want to get in touch with uh, people working at GData. Uh, here are some facts. Um, actually, Marcus is giving one talk at HackPro, uh, but it is not an external talk. So um, today is the last time we are offering this evening event for this term. But of course, we will start again in May. Um, so if you have further um, questions, don't hesitate to come to me after the talk. And if you like the whole course, of course, it's <laughs> free if we have available seats uh, to join us uh, in the summer term uh, to see the other external speakers or whatever. So feel free to join us, even if you now completed the course successfully or whatever. We always love to have a lot of people around to have nice discussions. So, so I talked enough, I guess. Uh, Martin will introduce himself. Please, let's give him a warm welcome. So, hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to my presentation on turning incident response to 11. Um, I'm proud to have been invited here to, to speak to you. Uh, basically, uh, I was unsure about the level uh, of technical depth you already know. Uh, so if you're bored or if you're interested into more details, feel free to interrupt me anytime. Uh, there's no, a talk is always as useful as the things that stick in uh, your head once you leave the door. And, if there are only question marks, uh, I failed uh, as a presenter. So who am I? Martin Schmiedecke, I work for SBA Research. Uh, small note about SBA Research, we are a nonprofit research center focused entirely on security. Uh, we do research across all spectrum, uh, trying to cover everything from organizational security to Rob JIT, whatever the fancy terms are right now. Um, my personal field of interest is digital forensics. So this is where I did my PhD and where I'm particularly interested in. Um, but I'm also working a lot in online privacy, uh, network security, Tor, uh, browser fingerprinting is also an area of interest for me, uh, and uh, so forth. Uh, also, I like memes. Uh, so if you, you will see some of the memes that I prepared today. Uh, if you're following me on Twitter, you have seen some of them already, uh, but still please, do uh, as if you were surprised. Um, small note about the, a uh, small disclaimer about the memes. Uh, even though memes are always funny and they, they uh, try to push a feeling or cause a feeling, um, all the topics here have a kind of, um, they, they have an uh, earnest background, it's not earnest, but they have a serious background. So uh, incident response, if there is a company that is breached, if there's user data exposed to the internet and so forth, uh, this is always people's data, which is publicly available, uh, which is not a good thing. So even though that there will be some pictures, uh, not of cats, but uh, other funny pictures, um, the background, keep in mind, this is uh, serious for some people. And even though not in Germany, but identity theft in the US is a thing. And other parts of the world, of course, where you get um, to experience terrible things if you are on the wrong uh, leaked password list. So, um, I always show this uh, as a particular example. This is General Petraeus. I don't know if you know him, but he was uh, the chief of, uh, the master chief general of the CIA, uh, and he had an affair. Uh, and he got caught because the, the woman who was he, he was having the affair with uh, threatened another woman because she was suspecting that she also had an affair with General Petraeus, uh, and then threatened her with an email or so, FBI started investigating. They found out, whoops, they share a mailbox where they send each other love letters and try to arrange stuff. 
Um, and uh, he was the, the chief of the CIA, Central Intelligence Agency. This is spy mastercraft, and not even this guy knew how to hide an affair appropriately um, and failed. Shit got real and uh, his affair got public. So don't do it like Petraeus. Do not share a Gmail account where you save a draft uh, instead of sending it. Uh, not, not the good thing to do. So what, what is your expectation? I, I reread, uh, for, for the content of today's presentation, um, I reread the, the short abstract that I've sent, uh, and I thought, okay, might be a li little bit biased towards log and log analysis. Um, Spoiler alert, it's not about log files. Logs are nice if you have them. They are particularly nice if you have them centrally logged and searchable and all those things which are nice. Um, but this is not about uh, log files. Um, it's also not about defenses. So um, I read the other, I, I saw some of the other talks and I uh, read about this is an offensive security class and so forth. Um, it's not particularly offensive. Um, but you might abuse it to, to something offensive. Um, still, it's not strictly offense or defense, um, but the, the focus is that uh, it's always post-incident. So whether or not someone clicked on a phishing mail or opened uh, the Excel sheet and enabled the macros, um, it's always that something has happened, something has escalated, uh, and in the end of the day, maybe one of you is the person arriving at the scene, so to say, uh, and is tasked with investigating, finding out what happened, uh, what the attacker might have been able to do and what uh, he or she actually did. Uh, specifically, and this is the, the uh, 11 part, not, did you, just a small survey, did you get the reference turning it to 11? Who got the reference turning it to 11? Oh, damn it. Um, so there's, um, and now I'm embarrassing myself because I'm not sure what's the name of the guy, but the uh, guitarist of uh, the guy playing the guitar from the White Stripes, uh, he has a documentary about himself and it's turning it to 11. So the Marshall uh, amplifiers for electric guitars, they go from zero to 10, that's a scale, um, but some of them go to 11. So taking it a notch up and, ah, damn it. Yeah, so the, the focus here in, in this presentation is uh, things that scale. So um, as the introduction already said, it's all fun and games at the university. You get a virtual hard drive, which is, uh, I don't know, 10 gigabytes in size. But then you go out in the field, you're obviously interested in security. And then you start, either you start consulting or you start as a software developer. Um, you have a security focus in mind. Uh, and if you are at the wrong time, at the wrong place, some things might unfold that you may or may not be tasked with uh, investigating an incident. And this is not the two 10 gigabytes uh, virtual hard drive. This is us usually something way bigger, something like the production exchange for a 1,000 people company. How can you analyze one of those things without taking it offline. Every time uh, you will go to an administrator and saying, hey, we're taking down your production system, you won't have email for the next 24 hours, they will scream, they will shout, and they will hit you with uh, things to stop you from that. So the, um, the idea is to present things that uh, scale uh, in a sense that they work uh, independent of the number of affected systems. This, this is my personal context here, um, because usually if, for example, an attacker gets a golden ticket, can do whatever he or she wants in the company network, you don't want to analyze this one computer where the uh, infection started to spread. You want to anal analyze everything, and you want to analyze it uh, in time. So even though logging, uh, even though this talk is not about logging, Having proper logging is, of course, very useful. Um, so setting up a central log management is, is really easy. Um, you can run the ELK stack. You can run syslog uh, D. Uh, I'm pretty sure there's something for Microsoft events. I'm never worked deeper than uh, start an origin or Steam on Windows. Uh, but I'm sure there's something where you can uh, collect centrally the Microsoft events for an entire company, which is a good thing. Um, usually, 
uh, it's the other way around. So if you come to an incident, some network got breached, um, people find out that, whoops, something went wrong with the logging. Uh, we don't have any logs. Sorry for that. So what, what exactly is incident response? The, um, of course, you could start with a formal definition, blah, blah, blah. Um, but matter of fact is that companies really fail to detect intrusions. This is bad for us as a researcher. This is bad for the industry. This is bad for everything um, because nobody likes false positive alerts. Uh, nobody likes to, to read in the newspapers that his or her account has been preached uh, and so forth. These are some examples from the past, I don't know, five, maybe seven years where companies got into real troubles because they got hacked and they got hacked big time, uh, and they failed to detect it for a month. The context here is that once you get notified, you enter the company, uh, and what I would like to show you is some techniques that you can then do without knowing anything about the company beforehand or the network or the infrastructure, um, and can run analysis techniques which might or might not uh, give you information. Hacking team, this Italian company, uh, they leaked their internal emails, they leaked their source code. Um, also RSA, not sure if they're still used, but they used to make, who here knows the RSA dongles? These small key chain thingies that have a code. Um, RSA got hacked twice uh, and lost the seeds for those dongles. So which was then used to attack McDonnell Douglas to steal plans for parts of the F-35 combined something fighter. Um, they got hacked and I'm pretty sure, sure uh, they're still selling those things and they're still keeping the seeds somewhere deep in their basement. Uh, also Google with, with Operation Aurora, uh, you can read it up on Wikipedia, it's really interesting. Um, someone hacked into Gmail to get access to emails uh, of specific accounts, and while they were at it, they also got access to the Gmail source code, which is not a good thing. Um, yeah, of course, Stuxnet, you can read everything about Stuxnet. Um, also, Stuxnet was specifically designed to thwart detection. Uh, this is why it's in uh, braces. So, and of course, you're interested in security. If you read the news, if you read Heise, Golem, whatever, uh, it's APT, APT, APT. Most of those APTs are neither A or P. Some of them are T, but eh. um, And uh, yeah, once you leave this university, you will maybe work something security related. Uh, so the, um, this might or might not be interesting for you uh, if you work in this field for the next few years. So this is the context. Um, this is the stage I'm trying to set to you. Uh, welcome to incident response. There are attackers everywhere. There are countries hacking each and every one of us. Um, there are Android devices which are unpatched for years and so forth. Um, what are the generic rules of incident response? So the time is often an issue, but it's not a per se issue. So um, for you as a responder, it's important to react in time. Uh, but usually, all the action already happened. So the, the first rule, um, I'll come to that in a second. Uh, the, the goals for uh, incident response is to react, figure out uh, what's happened. Uh, and if you run a network, you want to contain the attacker, you want to prevent uh, lateral movement, uh, and so forth. Um, my background is digital forensics, so ideally the uh, incident response process already goes hand in hand with forensics. So you identify the computers, the accounts, you lock them, uh, you collect all the log files, um, and so forth. Um, yeah, usually it's under time pressure because publicity is an issue, uh, and so forth. Press got already notified that there has been some data loss, uh, and so forth. And what's also very important is that all those tools uh, or techniques should work remotely. You do not want to go down to the basement to find this one server. Um, you would like to stay in your office. You want to stay uh, probably not next to the window where it's bright, but uh, in your dark corner. I would like to stay in the dark corner um, instead of going to the basement where it's cold uh, and loud. So we would like to do this remotely. And of course, business pressure, you should be done by yesterday, but this is the case for uh, almost anything you might or might not be doing. 
So you come to a company, they tell you, okay, we had this incident, it all started six weeks ago, there was this email, it spread like wildfire, they contained it. Uh, in the end, there started malicious apps popping up on this and uh, computers, uh, and now they're all encrypted for some reason. Might happen. Uh, first rule of incident response is you always try to get a RAM image. Uh, the RAM is important. Everything that sits in RAM is non-persistently stored. Um, they, the RAM keeps information which is vital for analysis. Number of running processes, which processes are running, uh, net, open networks connections, ARPs, uh, caches, uh, and so forth. Second rule of incident response is you always get a RAM image. This is really important. That's why there are at least two rules uh, just for getting a RAM image. Uh, if you do not uh, investigate the RAM, you're doing it wrong for many, many cases. Uh, law enforcement, for example, uh, some of them still don't get the RAM. They just stick by the book. The book is 10 years old, and the book says you unplug the machine on site, you take it to the lab, and then you analyze it, which is, of course, fine for uh, cases where there is no disk encryption, where there is no uh, yeah, I'm sure you can think of a scenario where uh, RAM content might be useful uh, for forensic analysis. Um, yeah, volatility is, for example, a very, very great tool. Um, was open source since the beginning, and there's a 700-page book uh, just for Windows RAM analysis with volatility. Um, it's a really great tool to analyze RAM content to figure out what is currently happening on this machine, uh, and not just for Windows, but also Linux and uh, all the other fancy operating systems that are used um, today. <clears throat> and of course, you never reboot the machine. You really try to avoid this. You do not want to have the RAM swiped. You, uh, um, wiped, not swiped. Um, you want to have the process list. You really want to stick with the information that is there, uh, which is also uh, a problem uh, because sometimes you have to reboot it. Sometimes RAM acquisition fails. Um, you have to hard reset the, the machine, uh, and then you cannot, then your only hope is that you uh, find traces uh, and can move on in your analysis without RAM content. So the best case, uh, if you have to investigate something, it's one machine. Um, there's no lateral movement in the network, so it's a contained, isolated machine. This is the best case university-wise. Uh, this is what you uh, work with. Um, and for acquiring RAM content, this is straightforward. For Windows, there are numerous tools available uh, which can dump your content of the RAM uh, straight to a network drive or a USB thumb drive. Uh, for Linux, there's Lime, uh, which is a tool uh, you can use to, to copy the entire RAM uh, to a file or uh, a network. Uh, it used to be the case that uh, the memory was mapped directly into the Linux kernel. Uh, so there was defmem, which I think kernels prior to 2.6 uh, had this interface where you could access uh, as root the RAM. Somehow kernel developers figured out it's not so good a idea to have kernel, uh, to expose the kernel a direct interface to the RAM. So now you have to load a kernel module for uh, all the kernels or use Lime, which does that for you. So, and this is the third rule. Uh, usually if you happen to stumble upon incident response, it's usually you that has to acquire the RAM content, not by definition, not by uh, any social norm, uh, but usually you have heard something of incident response. You know how this goes, uh, and as long as this is not a dedicated consultant's firm which does exactly incident response, um, you will be the one uh, who knows how to uh, copy the RAM. Uh, at least that's my experience and this uh, has happened to me. So getting a RAM image sounds easy. Um, in the best case, it actually is easy. There are funky attacks where you can copy. Uh, there's the cold boot attack, for example. These are really fancy corner cases. Um, but in practice, getting the RAM content can be tricky. Uh, one of problems, for example, it's not that uncommon anymore to have a server with one terabyte of RAM. 
Where do you dump this to? How do you copy it over the network? Transferring one terabyte of data, even with 10G connections, it takes some time, and this is annoying. Um, also, how do you uh, analyze an entire network, or even subparts of networks, which are, in, in larger companies or this university, you have a lot, a lot, a lot of machines which could be uh, of interest. Also, 10 gigabit network links, it's actually kind of cheap to buy these things. Um, so they, they will become commonplace. Um, network forensics deals with the idea that you take everything from the network line, you dump it onto a computer, and then you analyze it. But how do you do this with 10 gigabit? I just have a regular PC at home, and the fastest interface I have is 6 gigabit per second SATA. So I have to throw away half of all the uh, network information just to dump this onto my uh, SSD. Uh, and of course, terabytes of storage. Um, how much is an eight terabyte hard drive nowadays? I think it's 200 euro. Um, this is really, really a pain in the ass to analyze. Um, the, the forensic process, I'm not sure uh, if you have a background in digital forensics or had a course to that, but usually what you do is if you have to analyze a hard drive, uh, is you start with hashing it. So you build the SHA-1 sum across the entire hard drive. Uh, and for an eight terabyte hard drive, this takes some time. Uh, something between 16 to 36 hours if it's a slow hard drive. Um, then you copy it, which is another 16 to 36 hours. Then you hash it again to prove that you have not uh, modified the data which is on there. And this gives you an entire work week which is spent just with watching the progress bar um, hashing. No, of course, you're not watching it, but uh, this is the, the best practice. So you hash it, then you copy it, and then you hash it again. Uh, and for large hard drives, this takes a considerable amount of time. If you multiply this with a software RAID array, um, and yeah, someone who is um, in, yeah, someone who has a lot of data um, can be a pain in the ass for law enforcement. I, I heard from a friend who is a blah, 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 um, that uh, there was one case, <coughs> and uh, the, the, one of the problems police had with this case was that uh, all the data which was of importance was 90 gigabytes. This is not much. Uh, and why is that a problem? Because they had to burn it on DVDs. And if you, <laughs> and, and if you have like uh, a small movie collection, something, I don't know, um, you can be a pain in the ass for police if you have terabytes and terabytes of hard drive. Of course, I'm not suggesting it. Uh, if you're smart, you're encrypting it, then they won't do anything with it anyway. Um, yeah, 90 gigabytes. So this is where computer science kicks in. Um, computer science loves to parallelize things. Um, all the bad things uh, which are done in, in computer science, they are non-parallelized. They are not running concurrently. Uh, if you think of Hadoop, Hadoop is amazing and it works that well because it parallelizes across a possibly infinite number of machines uh, the work. So everything that happened in database systems the last 20, 30, 40 years um, was not strictly parallelized because it was confined to this machine um, or this cluster. And then there's Hadoop which says, Puh, we don't need uh, the third norm form, I don't know the English term, uh, we just do NoSQL mumbo jumbo and then we spread it across a cluster of thousands of machines. Uh, and this is how things operate nowadays. You, you throw machines at it and uh, in the end uh, you, you're done more quickly. So what I want to talk now is about tools uh, that work and approaches that work or can work to some extent when you have to access or have to analyze huge amounts of data. Uh, I'll start with the network because network is rather, rather easy to solve, rather straightforward. Uh, there are a few tools uh, which are well established, so maybe every one of you knows Wireshark, knows TCP dump, uh, Scapy, all those tools which are um, useful for inspecting network traffic, um, they usually work also with larger amounts of uh, data. Network traffic is of course also interesting because if, it's an, if, if the malware or if the attacker is not uh, specifically trying to hide, um, it's really easy to, to analyze it because it's usually just plain text. 
and even in the absence of plain text. So if the person you want to analyze is using some form of encryption, uh, there's always metadata. You cannot hide the metadata like the IP header, the IP port, all those things which are part of uh, the, the protocol which you need uh, to transfer on the wire. Also, acquisition is often easy. So if you have a network, even with a hundreds machine, hundred of machine, there's just one internet connection. So you have this single point of interest uh, that you would like to analyze to figure out what's happening on the network. Some challenges, of course, uh, still exist. Uh, so what happens to 10 plus gigabit networks. Uh, interestingly, uh, thanks to Edward Snowden, we're well aware of how to analyze multi tens of gigabits connections uh, at scale. Um, there is, for example, this one Israeli company, which was already seven years ago or so, selling uh, clusters for uh, network analysis that can do 40 gigabits and uh, probably nowadays 100 gigabits. <clears throat> In reality, it's often tricky to figure out where to tap. So do you want to have the data before the firewall? Then you have those multiples. Uh, you have the DMZ. You have all those VLANs. And this, all the things can make it rather complicated um, on where to tap. Um, I'm currently running a research project where we would like to see how people use TLS or how the computers use TLS. Uh, and I had to talk like half an hour at least with our sysadmin just to figure out where to put the tab because the one core switch we had already uh, has a mirror part. So the, the, high, the expensive switches, they can do mirroring. Um, but they probably, most of the times, they can do just one mirror port. If you want to add a second one, things can become nasty. Um, so yeah, so availability of a mirror, or sometimes it's called monitor port. Uh, for incident response in a company, this is usually easy because larger companies buy more expensive switches, uh, and you can get uh, right away access to this. Uh, if you don't get this access, things can become tricky, so you need to bring in your equipment, you need to mirror the, the traffic, and uh, still doable, but it needs a bit of fiddling. <clears throat> uh, even more interesting, how do you uh, tap a fiber, so you're not in uh, control of the, the endpoints. You just see, have this one fiber, you would like to tap it. Um, and thankfully, again, uh, there are documented uh, instances available where how to tap a fiber. Uh, of course, NSA does or did this um, with Google and all those other uh, entities which got hacked by the NSA uh, because the uh, all those companies, they were renting dark fiber. They were renting dedicated connections between data centers. And of course it wasn't encrypted. Why would anybody would encrypt a data center to data center connection which is uh, just in their internal network? It's not publicly exposed. Why would you encrypt it? Well, now they do. Yeah, and another thing which is uh, also uh, a thing that works, Stenographer is a tool by, developed and maintained by Google, um, which has the dedicated task of running packets it observes to disk as fast as possible. So if you have a, a 10 gigabit network connection, I envy you, um, but also uh, you can run this on an array of SSDs and it will try to write the packets as fast as possibly to the disk. How does it do that? Uh, it, simply dumps it there. There's no stream reassembly, there's no uh, analysis or pre-computation involved. Um, usually the thing that is computationally expensive is to reassemble the packets and to get the TCP stream to make it readable or uh, to, to figure out uh, what's going on. For compromised machines in a network or uh, in a company, uh, there are a few open source uh, solutions available which are written by the big players. Uh, there's GUR Rapid Response uh, written by Google. There's OS Query by Facebook. Uh, and there's the Mix Suite by uh, Mozilla. And they all have the same exact problem. They have hundreds and thousands and even more servers running somewhere. And they do not want to go down to the uh, basement or down to Ohio uh, 
uh, to get this one server to do incident response. They want to have it remotely, they want to have it at scale, uh, and they want to have the capability to figure out what's going on as fast and as cheap uh, as possible. So all those three do more or less the th same thing. Uh, they can be used for, for incident response. Uh, and they only differ slightly regarding capabilities or uh, specific interesting things uh, that they can do. Yeah, as I said, Google has data centers, Facebook has data centers. They have hundreds of data centers um, stuffed with computers and uh, interfaces. Um, and you do not want to do this manually. <clears throat> so as I said, GUR rapid response, um, probably previously Google rapid response, uh, is a tool specifically built for incident response. So this is not only developed, but it's also used by uh, Google for incident response, which makes it very interesting because many of the problems that Google have, they, they are solved with very scalable technology. Think of big table, think of, I don't know, any, all, yeah, there are so many things Google wrote uh, which pushed the, the parallelization uh, of computer science to another uh, level. Yeah, it's open source. It's open source since uh, six years uh, now. It's Python, which makes it very readable. Uh, and the basic idea of GUR is that it uses local agents uh, which are lightweight and which are uh, very uh, non-obvious. Um, think of, um, of course, it's an American company, so if you want to ro roll it out to uh, a network of employee machines, I I'm a techie. I don't want to have anything running on my machine which might clock even half a CPU core. I would notice and I wouldn't like it. Um, so this is why uh, it's lightweight. Also, it's interesting for legal uh, things. So if you want to investigate a company network, you cannot simply just roll out uh, GUR for analysis. There's something like a Betriebsrat and so forth. So this is just the, the technical part uh, for server or infrastructure monitoring. Um, but you can do the math how to, to scale this up. Um, the nice thing about GUR is that the, the logic is server side. So you have beefy rack of hardware which does all the, the number crunching. The agent is really dumb. It runs on every machine that is uh, part of the monitoring. Um, and uh, everything is packed into a non-obvious, uh, into an obvious uh, executable. So you, uh, during the setup, you, you, the, the server generates this one executable with everything packed in there. You have the config, uh, you have the endpoints where this agent is connecting to, you have all the security information, the signatures, uh, and so forth. Uh, there's not even an installer where you click next, 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 which would you expect uh, if you just want to run something. So it just installs itself as a service. Uh, and of course, this is easily orchestratable. So you can run this out with, you can run it on any machine uh, using puppets, salt, whatever uh, you use, uh, simply by uh, pushing it to all the machines. Uh, what's also nice is that um, you can do incident response with this. So, for example, you can say from all the machines, give me your MAC address and uh, all the machines will connect back to you and give it to you. Uh, and also the machines which are not currently running uh, will connect back to you. So if you have, uh, for example, one software developer which is currently working in Southeast Asia, uh, not only does he have a different time zone, but he also uh, goes online in the evening on a flaky 56K uh, dial-up, um, still uh, works, which is, personally, I find that cool. Good things uh, about GUR is it, it has a web GUI, um, which makes it very easy to, to understand. So of it's not easy to understand, but if you fiddle around a bit, uh, you can uh, abstract all those incident response, all those uh, digital forensic artifacts. It doesn't matter for the, the agent who is doing the uh, analysis. Uh, of course, it scales very well. Um, I've heard of at least two instances where GUR is running on 100,000 and more uh, machines, um, which is, I find it impressive. Um, yeah, configuration and rollout is easy and it's a long-term supported project. So they will, they, uh, Google is actively using it. Um, of course, they're not giving all their eggs in one basket, but they, they have a very active community on um, pushing this out. So 
if I would have to start, uh, put it that way, if I would have to start an incident response consultancy today, um, I would use some machine, uh, put GUR on it, go into a company, give the executable to one of the admins and say, hey, push this to all the clients, you will do a group policy update, blah, 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 bam, done. Very easy. The things which are not so nice about uh, GUR is that uh, it's not strictly user-friendly, so uh, the setup can be tedious. Um, it can no, not, nah, it's not a con. So you have to know Python and figure out if something breaks, where it breaks, this is um, expected. Um, and uh, as I said, uh, privacy and legal implications can be problematic. Um, it's not like uh, you can push this to all the machines um, in a, same way, um, yeah, you, you can get into trouble for this. Also, GUR is more or less the perfect command and control channel, like seriously perfect with signatures and encrypted communications and everything. Um, so I'm anticipating that GUR might or might not be found in uh, some form of command and control channel uh, in the future. Don't do this, please. One thing about GUR which is really, really cool uh, is that it can live RAM analysis. So you can do volatility on the live RAM, which is really nice. So you do not have to copy this one terabyte of RAM across the network. Uh, you just run your commands uh, and the GUR agents runs it on the live RAM. Of course, you can fuck up things with this, um, but uh, yeah, in the Google way, if a rack dies, uh, it doesn't matter, just reboot it. Um, yeah, still, uh, I think it's really cool because transferring a large amount of RAM uh, in a file is a pain. <clears throat> Some of the, the internals of uh, GUR, everything you task is a so-called flow. This is the work unit. So every, I don't know, 10 minutes, the, the client agent connects back to the backend and says, hey, do you have a new flow for me? Um, and if there is a flow, um, the client fetches it, executes it, and uh, pushes it then back. Uh, what, uh, yeah. what you can also do is uh, you can do some timelining. So you can say once a week I wanna, or every 10 minutes I want to see of all the high important servers. Uh, I want to see the, the number of which processes run, uh, the hash sums of the executables, uh, and so forth. And you can do some form of baselining. What, Google uses it for is they, um, they use it for outlier detection. So if they have a set of, I don't know, 15,000 machines and they all serve the same purpose, um, you can do with a simple histogram. You can figure out which of the machines is going nuts because the number of running processes is slower than uh, all the other machines or the number of open network connections is much higher. Uh, all those things uh, are very obvious if you see a histogram and you can see uh, what's going on. Uh, what's also possible is hunting. Uh, it's a flow running on the entire fleet. Uh, so for example, if uh, Kaspersky is releasing a new document for one of the APTs which uh, can be uh, found in the wild, um, they usually have sh some indicators of compromise in them like file names, like, um, I don't know, Yara rules or uh, anything that can be used to identify whether or not you're affected. Um, GUR makes it easy. You just write a flow, you just push it out to the entire fleet of N servers, N client machines, uh, and you have the response within 60 minutes for all the machines which are running. Yeah. The other stuff uh, I've already talked about. Uh, also nice, the client will kill itself if, if it becomes too greedy, uh, so if it uses too much memory or too much CPU time, uh, it just will kill itself. Uh, interesting for distributed systems people is that of course it has some form of uh, heartbeat, uh, so if the client uh, goes rogue, it will also be killed and restarted. <clears throat> OS query is kind of similar. Uh, it's the implementation by Facebook, again, for monitoring uh, their uh, precious hundred thousand or millions of servers. Um, but it's slightly different in that it exposes some SQL-like query language. So you can get with an SQL query uh, the list of the running processes, the number uh, of open network connections, um, and so forth. 
similar thing. Um, even though the focus is slightly more on monitoring, you can also use it for uh, incident response. Yeah. You, can, yeah, you can monitor file system changes. Um, the focus is clearly on, on uh, monitoring, but if you find suspicious registry changes, for example, in Windows machines, um, this is exposed uh, with uh, a table or table-like thing in OS query. Yes, please. APT? Oh, advanced persistent thread. So uh, if you read the blogs, um, this is some kind of campaign to uh, have, it's, it's not just a regular port scan where you want to infect some, um, but it's a persistent attacker which really tries to, to attack you. And usually what all these uh, antivirus company do, is GData releasing uh, re white papers and IOCs? Yeah, yeah, APT, yeah, 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 yeah. APT is part of cloud uh, buzzword bingo. Um, it's the new cloud and the more advanced cyber. Um, but usually, it means just an attacker, and uh, with an IOC, you can detect it. It's like a hash value of a file, uh, which can be used to figure out whether or not you're infected. Um, yeah, usually those reports are for. Uh, the Russian or the Chinese uh, state-sponsored hackers, never about the, yeah, sometimes about the US-based hackers. Um, but if you Google, Google around, there are numerous groups which are constantly analyzed by those uh, antivirus companies. Yes. Uh, the last one in the, uh, in the trio is MIG. Uh, again, Mozilla has a fleet of servers. They really want to figure out what's running on them. Um, yeah, it's running, it's written in Go um, because it, apparently someone said, hey, let's do it in Go. Uh, uh, but still, it's open source. Uh, at least it's not Rust. Uh, no, wrong direction, wrong direction. All right, so these, these are the agent-based uh, solutions which you could use uh, for uh, analysis. Um, but since I'm, my background is digital forensics, I'm of course interested in, in the file system. So what happens uh, on the disk, what is written to disk, and uh, how does it uh, happen to uh, give insights into what, what happened. So for the regular tools, um, just figuring out, parsing the file system metadata and figuring out, okay, what are the timestamps, this is a solved problem. There are numerous vendors selling file system analysis uh, not appliances, but software packages. Uh, there's NKs, FTK, G, uh, I don't know. Numerous of them are available. Uh, usually for incident response, timelining is interesting. So you have the timestamp of the suspicious email, uh, and then you want to figure out, okay, from that timestamp on, what happened in the file system. Um, if you can do it live, it's even better. Uh, if you start an executable, you get usually a report of uh, read files, written files, uh, changed registry keys. And uh, what some people uh, do is to create super timelines. So you combine timestamps from all the different sources available, log files, emails, uh, browser history, and so forth, just aggregate it into one gigantic timeline, uh, which is then a super timeline. Um, yeah, also for uh, getting an overview of the, what's on the disk, uh, there's this one tool, Firewalk, uh, which is part of SleuthKit, or SlithKit, or however you pronounce it, um, which makes a pretty XML file about all the files it could find, uh, and including all the timestamps, including all, all the interesting things which are on this particular disk, including hash values. Uh, another tool, very interesting for file, analysis or digital forensic analysis is Bulk Extractor. Uh, it's a tool by Simpson Garfinkel, uh, and the core goal of this tool is to scale linearly with the number of cores. Uh, so however beefy your machine is, if you run Bulk Extractor, it will be pinned. 100% CPU. As long as the uh, hard drive you are analyzing is large enough, this will go on and on and on. So bulk extractor is, is a tool which is highly parallelized, uh, and the goal is to, to analyze um, chunks of data from the hard drive, 
and try to do certain operations on it. So um, if you have a compressed file, for example, bulk extractor will uh, unzip it uh, and will then analyze the content of the zip file. So uh, the most easiest tool for, for digital forensics is, is strings. Uh, whoever participated in a capture the flag contest knows that running strings on some binaries will give you the flag. Um, <clears throat> Uh, but of course, if the, the flag is compressed or if it's encrypted or encoded or whatever, um, this does not work. This is where bulk extract is very handy um, because it analyzes all those different um, possible encodings uh, which might be used to uh, obscure the view of the data. Yeah. Yeah, the interesting part is that it uses some form of opportunistic decoding. So if it finds something, so it does not rely at all uh, at the uh, file system. It just tries to figure out what's happening. Uh, if it finds uh, chunks of, for example, a Word document, uh, which is like a zipped uh, XML file, it will unzip it and then put it back into the queue. So everything is recursive in bulk extracting that it will try to decode base64, uh, it will try to unzip uh, files, uh, and will then feed it back uh, into the pipeline. Yeah, you can see the different things. Um, it'll, yeah, you probably won't see a bit, but the slides will be online, uh, I guess. Uh, the cool thing about bulk extractor really is that it uh, is uh, parallelized and then can find information which is uh, otherwise uh, overlooked. Yeah. Um, last but not least, I have to come to an end. Time is uh, running out. Um, bulk extract is powerful in that it will broaden the analysis. Um, but what I personally have been uh, investigating is how to figure out what actually is on the hard drive. So, for example, there's uh, the NIST NSRL real reference data set. It's a <laughs> Uh, list of hash values released by NIST, the National Institute of Standardization, uh, once every three months. Uh, and it contains a massive amount of hash values for uh, known benign files. So if you set up Windows, uh, m many of the files are completely uninteresting. And uh, what the NIST does then is to, to hash all those files, put it in a list, and say, OK, this SHA-1 value uh, is kernel 32 DLL of Windows XP. Uh, and it's not particularly interesting for uh, any investigation whatsoever. Yeah. Again, problem is we're drowning in data. You can buy 8 terabyte hard drives uh, without any problems. Um, yeah. Even though Firewalk will give you uh, a hash value for each of the referenced file uh, and all the timestamps and all the other uh, things which are interesting, it won't give you much information about what actually that file is. So you want to figure out, okay, which are the, you can do two approaches to, to do um, file identification. So you can do file whitelisting where you say, okay, these are the benign files. Um, I want to exclude them. Or you can do blacklisting, like figuring out if an employee took an important document and stored it on the USB thumb drive. Just by hashing all the things on this thumb drive, uh, you can compare the hash values. And usually what you would also like to exclude is everything which is uh, absolutely non-interesting for any investigation uh, whatsoever. Um, so Justin Bieber and Britney Spears, um, people do torrenting. I'm not sure about Germany, but in Austria, torrenting is uh, still a thing. Um, and the, the really cool thing about torrenting is that it's just a bunch of hash values. It's a bit tricky what you, uh, how, to, how to parse them and how to figure out what uh, they actually reference to. Um, but you can download the Justin Bieber something something album. I have no idea what, does he sell CDs or is it just, no. Nah. Um, so you can download the torrent, uh, you can uh, unpack it, uh, read all the chunk hashes, uh, and if you find one of those hash values uh, on a hard drive, you, s you can reliably say, okay, this hard drive has Justin Bieber on it. Yeah, whatever you do with that information. If, I'm, I'm, I'm not judging. If there is a Justin Bieber fan in the room, I'm absolutely okay with that. <clears throat> so the, the idea of this research project of mine I had was to, to collect as many torrent files as possible for research, it's science, um, and uh, then 
dissect them and figure out all the different chunk hashes which are in there. Uh, the good thing, at least from my understanding, the torrent files are copyright free. You can download them without any problem uh, because it's just the hash value of uh, the copyright protected content. I'm not a lawyer, um, yeah. So, but still, uh, you can collect the torrent files and then you can uh, parse the, the chunk hashes out of there uh, and use it for file fragment identification. So you can then create a big database of uh, hash values. You pipe it more or less into, uh, into bulk extractor and in the end of the day you get a list of torrent files which uh, can identify some of the data which is on that hard drive. So this, this work of uh, my colleague and myself was presented last summer. Um, yeah, I haven't checked the log, probably nobody ever used it, um, so I'm spewing it out in, the, in this audience uh, to make it not more popular, but at least somewhat popular. Never mind. Um, also, torrent files might be of interest in doing actual investigations. So if you have uh, a computer which is seized by law enforcement, it's, Mm, yeah, it might happen that there was some file sharing activity on this machine uh, and of course you, you're not interested into that. You usually have a real uh, investigation going on so you would like to exclude all the uh, Britney Spears and Justin Bieber's right away uh, and not waste any time in looking into these uh, data chunks. Uh, it's also interesting for example for uh, distributing material. So for uh, some uh, crimes, uh, it's not a problem to, to actually have the data, it's just a problem to distribute it. Um, of course, every copyright thing in Germany, I understand, is distributing a problem. Um, but you want to, ah, no, nah. I'm getting into to a law context, which, which is not uh, my thing. So what BitTorrent uses is chunking. It takes every file which, are, uh, which is torrentized, uh, concatenates them, and then hashes the different chunks. And these hash values are then distributed for uh, downloading. So this uh, gives the index on which chunks to, to download, how to verify that they are there, uh, and so forth. Uh, most often this is 256 kilobytes, but every value is possible, um, yeah, just, just as a background. So all the files are concatenated, um, the chunks are hashed, and with those hash values you can then figure out whether or not this particular movie is stored on those hard drive. Even though some of the data might have been over, uh, overwritten, even though file carving has not found anything, uh, and even though um, not necessarily the uh, movie might have, no, it, actually it has been there. So good thing is if you have if you find one of those hash values on the hard drive, um, the probability that this uh, hash value was there by accident is really, really small. Um, yeah, even though all the other chunks might have been overwritten and even though uh, maybe even reliably wiped, but as long as there is one chunk with one hash value, uh, you can uh, show that it has been there. Some of the problems with uh, torrents is that uh, torrents chunks in variable sizes, so it's not always 256 kilobytes, sometimes it's, uh, yeah, everything from 16 to uh, even larger values, depending usually on the software that created it, so sometimes it's dependent on the uh, size of the files, sometimes it's dependent uh, on uh, the, the software because it has a static uh, thing uh, and so forth. This is just a small obstacle, uh, but in the end of the day, and what we did was to download 2.6 million torrent files, extract all the hash values, and pipe this into a bulk extractor. Bulk extractor, highly parallelized, um, takes every chunk of data on this hard drive uh, and hashes it and can compare it against this uh, hash database, which is uh, really cool. Yeah, benefit, uh, you can find deleted and partially overwritten files. Uh, you can uh, have very few false positives because the chunks are rather large. Um, there's a paper by Simpson Garfinkel on uh, sector hashing. So ha what happens if you hash every, every sector of a hard drive, um, which is 4K by now, 
Um, there are sometimes false positives because, for example, Office has this ramping structure in, in like a gigantic header, uh, which always has the same hash value. Um, but by hashing larger chunks, uh, you can figure out, uh, you get simply less uh, false positives. Uh, and those hash DB files can be easily shared. Um, again, no copyright content in there, so you can just share it and use it for uh, file fragment identification. Yeah, so what we collected, 2.6 million torrent files. By now, it's probably twice that size, but I haven't checked before uh, I got here. Uh, what we did was crawling Pirate Bay and uh, kick -ass torrents. Uh, so if you're into internet archiving thing and you have a Swedish VPN, uh, you can download all this stuff. It's 2.6 petabytes um, and, uh, yeah, do whatever you want with that. Um, yeah, from, from those 2.6 million torrent files, we extracted 3.3 billion chunk hash values, um, which can then be used to, to identify 2.6 petabytes um, of data. Of course, researchers love uh, open things, so it's all available. Uh, if you're doing internet research on, I don't know, torrent age validation, go ahead, uh, just grab it. Uh, and we also, uh, provide the hash DB data sets so you can, if you have a hard drive and you want to figure out uh, what's on there, uh, just set up bulk extractor, let, have it run against those hash DB files, which is just uh, a flag in bulk extractor, and then you can figure out which files have been on your hard drive. If you occasionally happen to participate in file sharing of any kind, I'd be interested in having your feedback if you happen to run it uh, against uh, yours or a friend, a friend, a friend of mine's machine, um, I would be really interested because um, I know what torrents are in there and I don't know, I know what's on my machine, but without a priori knowledge, um, so this is, this is boring for evalu evaluating because it's, as long as the underlying hash sum is sound, uh, you always find the things you hide before. This is really boring. And as long as SHA-1 is collision resistant, which luckily it is, uh, kind of, um, as, yeah, so if you're interested in trying this out, it's just two open source tool, tools and uh, 80 gigabytes of uh, hash DB. Um, have it run against your machine and see what pops out. And then tell me, please, because I'm interested in this. Thank you very much.